what I don't see at the moment from any of the politicians is any sort of big vision for the role of education in society and what and how they're fundamentally going to address what is a very tired old system after 35 years since 1988 with a lot of perverse incentives, a lot of dark sides, and try and make it a more productive system that works for all children rather than just for some. Welcome to Rethinking Education. Education's critical friend. Fiona Miller, welcome to the Rethinking Education podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part. Very pleased to be doing this. Mm, It's my absolute pleasure. I'm afraid I'm going to begin by saying nice things about your book. Um, which um, (laughs) (laughs) I was, I know I'm a bit late to the party. It came out five years ago now, Mm -hmm. um, but it's brilliant. It's absolutely fascinating. And when we spoke um, off air last week, I hadn't read the book yet. And you said something like, oh, it probably doesn't really contain anything that you don't already know. That turned out not to be the case. (laughs) uh, Yeah, I, I, you know, and I'm somebody who's pretty engaged in the education debate. I I have a podcast on it, obviously, and I, you know, I work as a teacher trainer. And I think it's partly because we're sort of engaged at different levels, probably. You know, I'm a former teacher and I'm very sort of involved in what happens in classrooms and what happens in in schools and at the school leadership level. And, And you're somebody who's been much more engaged at the policy level it seems like looking at the the changes that have happened in policy and the way that they play out um on the ground as it were um but I, yeah really enjoyed it it's very well written very balanced as well I, I sort of was expecting a bit bit more of like a full-throated sort of um the critique of of the market the marketized um reforms of the last 30 years or so um but it was very sort of even-handed and you were quite balanced and you know willing to give credit where credit was due and so on um and that said you know you don't pull your punches where 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 um where you see room for improvement so so yes i thoroughly enjoyed it and as i just briefly mentioned i took something like ten thousand words of notes i just did a word count mainly i was just like reading vast screens of it into my into my Google Docs on my phone because um, there's just so much really interesting stuff in there. So thank you for writing it, and uh, and I, I found it hugely hugely illuminating. Um, so just for the benefit of listeners, could you sort of just pitch the book briefly and just explain what it was that led you to write it? Well, I, I was approached to see if I wanted to write a you know a short book about education by one of these education publishing houses. And I just read something, or somebody had tweeted something about the 30th anniversary of the Great Education Reform Act, which probably a lot of people around now in education may not even remember because it's now 35 years ago, so quite old. But just to remind your listeners, that was an absolute pivotal moment in education policy in 1988 when the Thatcher government decided to make some really widespread reforms to the way the school system operated, and I can talk about them in more detail later. So in 2018, it would have been the 30th anniversary, and it seemed to be a very good opportunity to look back at how successful they had been. In in, in the interim, you know, I've done lots of other things. that I'd been a normal journalist. I'd gone to work at Number 10. I worked for the Blairs. I'd come out and become an education journalist. And when I came out of Number 10, I was asked by Channel 4 to make a film. I can explain how that happened in a minute as well, to make a film about school choice. And that film was called, the. in the end, we decided to call that film The Best for My Child, because that was one of the, the sort of predominant philosophies in the, you know, the 1988 Act, that parent choice would somehow act like an invisible hand and make the system work very, very well. Yeah. Um, and it seemed it's a very good name for the book as well. And, you know, I've been writing about that whole issue about the market, the market reforms, parent choice, all the other things that go, you know, the way it affects the system and all the other features of the system that are there to sort of back up the parent choice and accountability system and what whether it's kind of had its day and it's time to think about something a bit new or tweak it now. I mean, you say that I'm even-handed. I suppose that is the journalist in me. But the other thing I've always discovered is if you want to get people to agree to change, and ultimately it has to happen politically, um, you know, it's better to 
see both sides of the argument and then say, but I've considered everything and what I think is, blah, you know, this is what you need to do. Yeah, of course, and and the truth is always somewhere in the middle, isn't it? And it, what this thing, this this these reforms haven't been done with ill intent. I think. I, th- I think it seems that a common theme that sort of seems to run through the book. We'll maybe get into this later. Is that there's there's lots of lots of the way that things are now, were just sort of unforeseen consequences of things mm-hmm. that people sort of blundered into without really that much forethought, and we're sort of stuck. And I think we'll we'll look at a few examples of that when we get into into the, the nitty gritty of, of of the market reforms and uh, and the, the the good side of, of what's happened in the last 30 years. And also the dark side, as you write, one of the chapters mm-hmm. is called the dark side. Um, and it, that was interesting. So when we spoke last week as well, I, I mentioned Michael Gove briefly, I think because the Progress 8 scores have just come out and lots of people are saying, oh, this is a vindication of Govism or something. And you said something interesting. You sort of said, oh, it's almost like there's like a, a BG and AG. Would mm-hmm. you like to just explain what you meant by that? Well, before Gove and after Gove. Yeah, you know, that's what I assume you meant, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's because of my age, partly. You know, it's like there are a lot of very young teachers and people in the sort of edu campaigning world. And one of the things that happened after Gove, a lot of people get it, got into commentating about education, partly because social media was just expanded massively. So you've got a whole new generation of people doing what myself and maybe a couple of other people have been doing for the previous 15 years, which was, you know, having views on education. And, and suddenly it became everybody's business. And... And that's why it kind of felt it, it, it felt quite divisive, you know, as if you were being pitted against, you know, there were those sort of people who weren't sure about what Gove was doing and all the Govite reformers, and you were being pitted against each other. Um, and I think that was something slightly new in education. I don't know if you remember that there was this Twitter account called Tory Education, which was li- widely believed to be linked back to Gove and the Department of Education, but it was it seemed yeah. to be designed to whip people up into a kind of frenzy of disliking each other and disliking each other's ideas, which is always a very bad way to get change. But it it suits the people, the protagonists in those situations, because they can distract everybody's attention with the fight that actually doesn't mean anything at all. Yes. Yeah, I do remember that account. I remember lots of people thought that the hand of Dominic Cummings was involved Mm. in there somewhere. It Mm. was very spicy. Um, Mm. But it was interesting because essentially people do talk about Gove as though though this was this seismic shift. But in this book, you sort of frame frame it. Yeah, it was like you 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 said last week that he essentially accelerated one aspect of, of this wider trend that's been happening since the 88 Reform Act. Um, and so let's get into all of that. But first, the, so the, the first chapter of the book is called My Story, because because your entrance to this was, was as a parent. I should go and get a copy of the book, because I can't even remember what was in and it. And as a, yeah, no, it's fine. I've got my one here. Yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, the, the first chapter is called My Story. And so I'd like to ask you about your story, but I'd like you to rewind further back, if I may, to ask you about your own experience of school. Where did you go to school? What kind of school or what kinds of schools did you go to? What were you like at school? Well, I grew up in London, um, the child of two working class parents who hadn't who'd left school at 14 and never gone to university, but had become professionals after the war and ended up in London, one as a teacher and another, my father as a journalist. And I went to my local primary school. In the city in Westminster, which was called first was an infant school called Robinsfield, and then a primary school called Barrow Hill Primary School, and it was the, it was still the era of the eleven plus. But I mean, when I was at primary school, it was very much the end of the sort of traditional education. Everybody sitting in rows, learning by rote. You know, my brother, who's eighteen months younger, by the time he got into primary school, it had all become child centred learning and everything that goes. With, some people have been trying to get away from ever since. But I, I don't, th- I don't recall doing the. 11 plus but there was obviously some sort of test in London at the time which which weeded out children to grammar schools or secondary moderns or there were some fledgling comprehensives then Mm -hmm. Uh, so I went to a girls grammar school Camden School for Girls which is quite well known and was an extraordinary place to be but in the course of yeah, so sorry. sorry to interrupt. So it sounds like you weren't particularly aware of the 11 plus at the time it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a big deal or anything I was aware of the fact that two of my best friends did not get to go to the school that I was going to. Right. Yeah, I could see that there was a weeding process, but I did, in terms of people saying, you know, that they, they did the test and it made them sick, I can't remember it. When I spoke to friends about that, they said, they, I think there was some sort of London-wide test where people did the 11 plus without it being, the test itself being particularly high stakes, but the outcome was high stakes. Mm. Um, I also had to do an interview to get into Camden School for Girls, but 
And I was always a year ahead of myself. So I went when I was 10. I don't know where. I jumped a year somewhere at primary school and I went when I was 10. So I was quite young, actually. Um, And, you know, it was an amazing formative experience. It was an incredible school. Still is an incredible school. I, I owe it so much of what I've become today. But I also was very, very conscious at the time of the people who were at the schools in the area where I grew up who went to what were then effectively the secondary modern schools or the sink schools, the schools that other people didn't want to go to. Yeah. And so when my children went to school in the same area where I grew up, I was very, very keen. I'm happy to say it's completely comprehensive now. Very keen that they went to comprehensive schools, their local comprehensive schools. And that's what we've always done. And we didn't even, you know, even though we we became parents after the 1988 Act, after school choice had come in, we didn't even bother to go and look at any schools. We just sent them to the schools that were ge- geographically closest uh, to mm. where we lived. Um, yeah, so I can say a bit more about my own education if you want, but it was very much a progressive girls' school in the 1970s, and we voted to get rid of the uniform. There were fantastic teachers. But, you know, what I can tell people about what it was like being educated then, it was there, there was no accountability. There was none of the pressure that schools are under now. There was none of the parental involvement. I mean, I fairly, hardly remember my parents being involved at all. Yeah. I think I got a great education, but it was a very different situation to the one that kids are in now. So when I hear people say, oh, you know, it was so wishy-washy and it wasn't rigorous enough and we had to make it more rigorous, well, actually, that's not true. It wasn't rigorous. It's much more rigorous now because teachers heads and kids are under so much pressure to perform mm. these exams and these league tables and often so i think there's a lot more pressure than there is now there was then yeah sure and and th- i mean th- there was also like it's not just the changes to accountability but it seems that there's been sort of so- a societal shift I was, I was probably a couple of years ago now i was listening to a program on radio four and it was about failure and about embracing failure and they were talking about how, like, it just wasn't normal in the 60s and 70s to sort of to have high aspirations for your kids and to talk about wanting them to do really well and to go to university and to, to you know, get well-paid jobs and stuff. It was like that wasn't such a, like, now that's sort of very commonplace that people talk about that and schools are sort of, the whole of schools are premised on this idea that, you know, getting kids to university is the, the most important thing and that we've got mm. high expectations. I don't know what your sense is of that. Well, you, I mean, you... when I went to university, only 10% of the population went to university, and that was a bad thing. So that was bad. So it was probably something right. that most people didn't think about. So there's that point, and it's mm. good that universities have been democratised and everybody can aspire to go to university. I'm a great supporter of that idea. It's also the case that parenting, education has been like a kind of, societal it's not not a societal it's become an individual good hasn't it rather than a sort of societal good so people feel that it's you know they feel they're in this kind of parental arms race they're all in competition with each other to see whose kids do best and who can give them more competitive advantage than the others Mm. because there were no there was no competition really between schools then that it just that just didn't exist you know and i think parents feel very judged now on how their kids perform because it's it's made been made to seem as a reflection on them so I think it's become quite a toxic situation in some cases. And then you've always got then you've got the kids whose parents were probably always aspirational, but just didn't have the means to realize those aspirations in the way that so other parents do, because they've got the money and they can with house or they can get private tutors or mm. send them to private schools or whatever. And, and and they're still the ones that I worry about most of all, because I think things have got a lot better for them. I mean, it was terrible under the fully selective system. Comprehensive schools are the best way to ensure that we get equity and excellence. But we still have this terrible gap um, that existed when I was at school. Yes. We never even found a way of closing it. But I think that's partly because in England, we still have a very hierarchical and marketized school system. Totally. Yes, indeed. And and I want to I want to get into that, but I'm going to stay with the the your history bit first. Um, So so you, you mentioned university. What did you do at uni? Well, I didn't really want to go to uni. You asked what I was like at school. I, I was a bit of a rebel and I didn't work very hard and I was much more interested in my social life. So I didn't really care about going to university, but I wanted to leave school and go to America, which I did for a year. And I worked over there. And then while I was away, before I left, my mother made me put in a UCAS form. <laughs> what, uh, what was called ACA form then, wasn't it? Mm. And I thought, well, I'll just do it anyway. So I just settled on a subject, economics, which I'd never studied before, and economic history, and applied to various different London colleges because I knew I didn't want to leave London. They weren't universities then, they were colleges past the University of London. And I was very lucky to get offered a place at UCL, even though I didn't have very good A-level grades. 
And so when I came back from America, I was like, I think of it, well, what on earth am I going to do now? I was quite glad to be able to have a place to go to university. So I went, and that's why I discovered to enjoy, learned to enjoy learning and work. And I worked really hard and did very well. Mm. And um, just always reminds me that, you know, everybody, people develop at different, different times, different stages, and we've got to keep opportunities open at every stage through their lives. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, when I, I ask people this question, lots of them say that university was the first place that they ever found that they enjoyed learning. Um, that's I did enjoy that... learning at school. I had, I really had some great teachers, particularly my history teachers, my French teachers, I remember. I, I did enjoy learning. I didn't like learning and working for exams, put it that way. Right. And yeah. I can remember things that I loved doing at school and fantastically inspiring lessons and so on. I'm not sure, in a way, I'm not sure that's what happens now so much in school because I think there's so much focus on pre preparation for exams that we've driven some of the enjoyment out of education. But, um, yeah, it was a very great privilege to go to UCL. I lived in London, so I was very happy, and I had lots of friends there. And, I, I you know, it was a great place to study. And I, did, I hated economics, actually. I mean, I have got a basic understanding of economics, but I love the economic history. And I got, you know, at the end, I got a good degree. I worked hard. And um, that got me onto the next stage of my life, which was to be a trainee, graduate trainee journalist with the Mirror Group newspapers yeah right okay there you go and the, the other question that i often ask which sort of runs alongside this life history stuff is this idea of significant learning an mm. idea that I, I first came across in the writings of carl rogers mm. who mm. talks about you know the learning that matters the learning that really sort of shapes you that changes your worldview that changes your the yeah the way that you understand the world mm -hmm. um and so i'm interested are there any sort of episodes and sometimes it's people that you met sometimes it might be a book that you found on a bus could be there's lots of different forms mm -hmm. of this but what what stands out is, is you think like are there any really significant moments that have shaped your life or your thinking well i think my a-level history teacher mike baldwin who i still remain friends with I, I remember he was teaching us about i can't really we were learning we were learning about something and he would we are talking about Lord Northcliffe, who was the founder of the Daily Mail. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, there was something about Lord Northcliffe's private life. I think he had a bit of a spicy sort of private life. And I was very interested in this aspect of this, this particular historical figure. And he said, I remember him saying to me, oh, you really should become a journalist because you're just interested in these sort of salacious details. And I've always remembered <laughs> that, not least because I then did become a journalist. And it's a very curious twist of fate, but he before he'd become a teacher, had been married to somebody who subsequently became a kind of public figure. So once I was working on national newspapers and this woman became a story, there was a story about her and somebody in the office said, oh, she was married once before. Does anybody know her husband? who her husband was? And I'm being an idiot. Said, yeah, well, I know who he was. He was my history teacher. So they, <clears throat> they sent me off to doorstep, this poor guy. Oh, no. <laughs> things as I was at school and he was absolutely mortified. And they got a snatch picture of it, which appeared on the front page of the paper. And I just thought that has come full, completely full circle. That's why it all sticks in my mind, because he said to me, you should become a journalist. And then I ended up standing outside his house trying to ask him about his private life. Wow. Wow. Amazing circularity. I bet you think twice before giving careers advice. Again. Yeah, but I think in a way it just reminded me that in those days we had, we had the sort of history lessons where people would be having conversations about wider issues rather than what the, the sort of course content dictated that you should be learning. Mm, yeah sure is there yeah, anything one thing. and then going to america i think was quite a formative experience you know to go you know in those days it was very different there were no mobile phones and i just went on my own for a year i don't think i ever spoke to my parents mm. I, mean, I certainly grew up very quickly there and i came back a very different person yeah were you on some sort of work scheme or something yeah i was i'm afraid to say working illegally here and there but <laughs> did the right. great on bus ride across from the east coast to west coast stayed in california for three months and then came home yeah so that was a big eye opener for me, you know, eighteen to go from London. Then it's not wouldn't be such a big deal now because people travel all the time. But it was just that you know the Vietnam War had just come to an end, and there were lots of people in the west coast of America who were very politicised in a way that I hadn't really been aware of before in London. So it was, it's that Vietnam. Mm, it was in the seventies, so it was just yeah. the, you know, that tail end of all the Vietnam stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, it's quite a bold thing to do at 18, isn't it, to go off by yourself? You're mm -hmm. obviously quite an independent spirit. Yeah, I think I was. It was very much a thing that oh, people do that now, don't they? They go off for a year. But yeah, no, I mean, I think I was. I didn't, I was very determined to do that first before going to university. 
But I'm very glad I did go to university. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It taught me how to learn in a different way and how to think in a different way. And I think that's one of the things that university, everybody should have the chance to do it because it's not just a way, it's not what you learn necessarily. Most people can't remember half the stuff they learn at university. It's how it teaches you to think and to Mm. analyze information and so on. I think that's very important, a lesson for life. Yeah, that's one of the things that's been very hotly contested in recent years, hasn't it? The sort of it's not what you learn, it's how you, it's not what you think or what you know, it's how you learn. Mm-hmm. Lots of people in that traditionalist Gove camp that we mentioned earlier are very much of the mindset that it's that it is all about what you know and it's all rooted, everything's rooted in domain knowledge and what have you. This is familiar territory to the, for this podcast, so we don't need to we don't need to. Yeah, I think for, there is a case, there is a point there that there is an inequality of knowledge, isn't there, in some children? And, and even you know, having what who's that guy, Michael, who wrote the book Powerful Knowledge, or I mean, I think there is Michael some, Young. Michael Young, I think there is some knowledge that all young people should have access to if they need it. But it's not the full story when it comes to education by any means, because the truth is you won't remember half of it later on in life. Yeah, that's you the, will certainly remember the case. How you learn to use your mind. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm definitely in your camp on that. Um okay, so so let's let's pick up this edgy thread again. Um so it's interesting just to take a, a step back. So prior to 1988, I had Mick Waters and Tim Brighouse on the podcast mm-hmm. a while ago, and and Tim had made the similar point that the, the, the Secretary of State used to have... Oh, yeah, that's in my book. I got three, it from Tim. Oh, right, there you go. I think you actually listed four. I think Tim said there was three. So they, they used to have three or four powers over mm-hmm. schools, and one right. of those was regarding the removal of air raid shelters from playgrounds. And so... They were basically pretty hands off <laughs> at that point. And one of the things that that changed in this in this 1988, the Great Education Reform Bill or Gerbil, as it was known, um, is that the Secretary of State suddenly had 250 powers, mm. and now they have 10 2, times that. Yeah, yeah 2,500, which is a ludicrous shift isn't it and this is very sort of just just knowing that alone is indicative of this huge shift towards you know a very over centralized system um and so there was the famous speech in the 76 was it callahan's yeah. secret garden speech yeah. and then nothing really came of that and then it was interesting that it wasn't until the third term of thatcher's government that that, that they, they started to look at education um and and previously, the education secretary was Keith Joseph, wasn't wasn't it? Who was very sort of a market market guy. <laughs> market. It was a very sort of ascetic and kind of an intellectual. I mean, I think a lot of it is about the convergence of people and policy in the time. So I think Ken's yes. combination of Ken Baker, Margaret Thatcher wanting to do something. He's quite a pragmatic politician. I mean, I went to interview him for the book. You know, he was. He did believe in it, but he also, you know, he knew how to get things done, as it were, and get things through and make them work. And yeah, right. There's an interesting example of that from where so so Keith Joseph was really interested in voucher system. Yeah. Um, where parents would be sort of given a voucher and they could choose where to spend it, and and Baker essentially brought that in by the back door. Um, we'll maybe come on to that, but it's, it's quite clever the way that he essentially, what you describe as a virtual voucher system, mm-hmm. where because the money follows the kid, mm-hmm. essentially he brought in that same that same degree of choice. But, but so so this Gerbil Act, you, you wrote that it set it, it set in train a series of legislative, political, and cultural changes within the education sphere that underpin every aspect of our schools' lives today. So please, could you just sort of, for the benefit of listeners, because obviously I've just read your book, but not everyone has, um, could you sort of give an overview of like what what was it in this act that was so sort of game-changing? Well, I think there were three things, and they didn't all come in with the act, but they all sort of triggered the change. Of the, game. the first right. one was the introduction of a national curriculum, which was really what the Callaghan speech was. Well, he didn't actually use the word secret garden. One of his, his spin doctors used them. But what he basically said is, you know, you could – there was too much variation across the country. You couldn't. You could go into a classroom in one place and find out something totally different was going into on in a classroom in another place. And so kids were getting an unequal experience. And teachers had too much authority, and they could basically decide what they wanted to do. Uh, we've gone too far the other way now, obviously. But so we brought in the national curriculum. That's a massive change, which we still, you know, so it's going to be a very enduring reform. Uh, the second one was it introduced this idea of local management of schools. 
So power was devolved away from local... Well, first of all, in London, you had Ilia, which was also got rid of. So it, it, in those sort of areas, the power went down to the local authorities and then from the local authorities to individual school governing bodies. I mean, they'd always been governing bodies, but they got far more power in terms of running their own schools, like managing the budget and, you know, managing the HR and things like that. So, and the final thing was this idea of introducing a quasi-market in education. So parents would have choice. As you say, they could exercise this choice by taking their virtual voucher. They could choose any school they wanted, although in reality, that choice is constrained by the number of places in those schools. So there was then became a sort of sorting mechanism whereby people could get into schools that were popular and less popular. And the logical conclusion of this, and I think I quote something from Thatcher, quoting, you know, she was carrying copy of Adam Smith's book around in her bag. But, you know, the invisible hand would then ensure that the unpopular schools, nobody went to them and they would just close down and wither on the vine. And the popular schools would just expand and the market would sort out education provision. I mean, that was a sort of big idea behind it. Of course, in practice, it didn't really work like that. But the the next stage of that was to introduce the tools of the market, which were Ofsted and and the league tables, by which parents, which parents could then use to choose which schools they wanted to send their children to. Um, and fundamentally, and there was a few other little things like the creation of new types of schools like city technology colleges, but fundamentally, that is the system that we have today. We're still operating within those, the four walls of that national curriculum, local management of schools, a complete evisceration of local authorities, frankly, in the terms of education provision, and this, this market approach. So parent choice reigns supreme. And what we haven't done is dealt with the fact that there are too many schools that can also select their own pupils, so parent choice doesn't operate fairly. And the, and we have never really addressed the ludicrous idea that schools can't expand and contract at will. To, I mean, Ted Rag used to talk about these sort of bouncing schools, you know, that they, they, you can't just sort of pop up a new wing of a school, even if parents want to do it, which mostly they don't want anyway. They don't want their schools to expand when lots more people want to go there. So you end up rationing places at the most popular schools, and it's usually the people who have the least resources who get pushed out. Yeah, I loved that. I loved that quote from the much missed Ted Rag. He talked about these porter cabins boinging up and down the motorway yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. to 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 cater for this, you know, contracting and expanding supply and demand in this marketized system. And it's it does sort of <laughs> it does a very good job of satirizing the whole idea. And, and but can I just say that I mean, what we saw in twenty ten was a re- revival of that idea with the free schools. Exactly the same thing again. We'll create these new schools where they're needed, even if they're not needed in terms of new places. Right. Parents want new schools, and eventually the old provision will just sort of die down. The people, the schools people don't want to go to, will die down. And there we went back to the same old arguments again. It just doesn't work. And in fact, what's happened in quite a few places is that the free schools have closed down because they weren't really that good. You know, I think Gove introduced this new element of just sort of mad innovation and anybody can open a school to try and push the, the, the kind of barriers, the boundaries further with the market idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and so and, and the other thing that's sort of that's interesting that's run alongside all of this. So there, there was this sort of quite ideological uh, experiment, if you like, that if we if we just open open up a marketplace, that we have more diversity of schools, and and one of the things that came in in that eighty eight act was to create these. First of all, only fifteen these city technical, technical. colleges, yeah. uh, which Maybe were essentially the. the um... What did you, well, there was another new type of school that which then became a big thing under the major administration. Grant maintained schools, that's right. Yeah, grant maintained. And that was one thing that I've that I found really useful for your book. Is that I've never really known what all of this language means because it's not that obvious. And voluntary aided versus voluntary trust and all of that stuff. Um, but something else that's so, so, so there was this quite ideological, and also that just, I don't just want to sort of belittle it as ideological. It's sort of there's a pragmatic element to it that if you in, that if you introduce choice and then you'll, you'll sort of try to incentivize schools to mm. to to work harder right to attract parents to attract more money because the money follows the child and so mm. you can sort of see that there's a logic to it you know it's mm. a very marketized logic and you're treating human beings like widgets you know you could critique that idea but there's a sort of there's a logic to it but what's interesting is that and you make this point in the book as well you sort of say that the government didn't just stand back and let the market let rip um, in the way that some small state conservatives might have wished, but that while espousing all of this individualism and, per- and personal choice in the way that Gove did as well when when um, he was talking about why schools should convert to becoming academies, there was also this 
huge uptick in as we've just talked about in in centralization and and actually the autonomy that these schools have you know this recent case of a school that's been in the new in the headlines this week and uh, one of the details that came out was that not even the head teacher is allowed to decide what what arrangement the tables should go in that's decided at a level above the school and and the, the head of one of the one of the schools that you quote in the book mm-hmm. one of the one of the multi academy trusts they say that their head teachers are more like heads of department mm-hmm. that all the schools are identical they all have the same timings they all have exactly the same stuff mm-hmm. and there's just a total been this total sort of erosion of like professionalism that's gone along with this supposed um, booming, you know, time of, of choice and autonomy and diversification, which is a weird thing to try to frame, isn't it? Like, how can those two things have been happening? Well, it's parallel? an absolute inversion of what they said they were doing. It's the opposite of autonomy. It's the opposite of diversity. I mean, that's the great irony. We probably had a more diverse school system when I was at school. You know, we had lots of different types of schools and lots of different ethos and lots of different uniform, no uniform, boys' schools, girls' schools, church schools, grammar schools, secondary modern schools. You know, it's always been a very diverse system. In fact, now we've made it a more uniform system. Mm-hmm. At, while we were saying we wanted to get rid of uniformity. But I think the minute you introduce a national curriculum, a national system of accountability, that's just inevitably going to happen. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the case. And I think that for that reason, you know, when you said, when you, I mean, we do still have lots of diverse schools in the way that you just mentioned. You know, there are single sex schools, there are schools without uniform. There's there's more school, more types of schools now than there were then. But I wonder just how diverse is that school system really when they all have, you know, a very similar looking curriculum, they all do the same exams, they all have assemblies and ringing bells, and the vast majority of them have uniforms. And actually, how diverse is that system really? It's not very diverse at all. No, it's it's sort of it seems to be diverse on the level of structures and the 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 legal and sort of regulatory underpinnings of these different the frameworks that underpin these different institutions. But if you go from one school to the next to the next, they, they it's just yeah, it's, it seems to be quite a monolithic. System. I think at one point something else happened, which was that there was, and I think this is true, certainly true of the post go era. There was a sub, there was a there was a seductive story that was told about diversity and innovation and, you know, parent group. But it was all being used to mask something else that was going on, which is, was to try and save money. And, the, you know, I think Osborne was very clear that the best way to save money on education was just to have 100 academy trusts running all the schools in the country. Then you weren't funding lots of different individual schools. You could just fund these 100 trusts, and then they could be responsible for distributing the money down. There would be economies of scale because they'd be running everything. I mean, basically, crew creating the local authority model, having let a thousand flowers bloom, they wanted to kind of narrow it all down to privatized local authorities. And what we've yeah. ended up with is a ton of ridiculous mixture of half academy, half maintained schools, you know, and then all these different types of schools within the maintained sector. And frankly, nobody can really manage it properly. And, it, and, and nobody really wants to address that issue because an, an incoming government really should try and put some order around that. I mean, I'm going, I'm, I'm going way past where we started off, which was about my own experience of education and so on. But that's kind of where we've ended up now. And I don't think anybody quite knows how to put the genie back in the box and create a coherent system. So, and the biggest problem with the current system is that you've got all these schools who aren't really accountable locally at all. Yeah. Um, they can more or less do what they want. So you've got problems with special educational needs, you've got problems with illegal exclusions, you've got problems with admissions. Um, and it's making the system far worse for the kids who've got the greatest needs. Yeah. Well, one one of the things that it's done, we're, we're definitely fast forwarding a bit now, but while we're here, it's incentivized schools. When you, when you, it's like we said, you know, if you're treating children like widgets or if you're treating like groups of schools like, like supermarket chains mm-hmm. who are in, in competition for finite resources, you incentivize, you know, you incentivize like schools to behave in quite unethical ways, which, you know, explains some of the things that you've just been talking about, about, you know, a narrowing of the curriculum, about dubious practices that like you say around off-rolling and what have you. And there's, there's, there's plenty more in that column. Um, and there we can see that the, the market metaphor, if you like, or the market sort of model that, that the system has become based on is wildly inappropriate because these are human beings <laughs> and, and the teachers are being treated quite often in really, really bad ways. Uh, head teachers, you know, hired and fired like football managers after one, one, mm. you know, set of bad results. 
um and and young people being treated you know like it's always like this horrible sort of inversion of jfk like they ask not what your school can do for your child but what what your child can do to make the school look good um it's it's created all of these sort of perverse incentives that have that uh, like you say it's very difficult to figure out how we how we unpick all of that well I, yeah i won't i think i put it in the book but there was one conversation where I had with a head teacher of extremely successful church school in london who said to me look if you expect us to work in a market don't blame us if we use the tools of the market to succeed right in her there case you, you know admissions and exclusions and particularly admissions and yeah. i have this criteria absolute joke they're about 13 pages long and involved you know how many times you've rung bell in the church and oh my goodness yeah i saw that bit yeah whether you were and it was incredible but it was just a weeding 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 out process to get down to the families who are most likely to be most yeah. and want to help their kids learn and there was one, was it the, the, the school that, that Gove and Cameron sent their daughters to that, that was asking for money just up front in the admissions package? It was like, can you make a donation to the school, which is illegal. But it was only because somebody had picked that up that it, that it sort of came to the fore. Yeah, but I mean, it's illegal, but if you're an academy, who, who can intervene? You can't go to the local authority. You can't approach the governing body. You have to go to the Department for Education. Well, yeah. they're not. If, they, if the secretaries, they're just not. They just don't intervene in some of these cases. Right. That's that was an interesting. Yeah. Way you can get intervention is by you know I found in my time is by journalism is by writing about it and making it a sort of public story, and then it becomes a bit embarrassing for the government, and then they have to do something. And I've got several examples of times when I have written about schools, including Holland Park, and it has led to change where all the other methods, governors, parents, complaints have just failed. Ofsted, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the one of the the um nice points in your book was where you described the the, 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 the schools that are in um chains as it were literally in chains because they can find that was it one head teacher described it as like getting married without the possibility of divorce because there's just no remit there's no recourse for appeal to say actually i don't i don't want to be a part of this 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 chain anymore i want out there's just no way for that to happen well that Um, was one of the great mistakes you know when that 2010 bill was passed you know people rushed headlong into becoming academies without reading the small print yeah, 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 absolutely. Right, let's let's rewind a bit, yeah, um, and go back to your entry into yeah. this whole thing. And so you you became a you you say at the start of the book that you became a governor almost sort of on a whim. Mm, what, what not happened? on a whim, but I mean, I actually had been a governor before when I was much younger. I've been a sort of Labour Party governor somewhere. But when my parent, when my children started at primary school, I was very very busy. I had a very busy job, and I was writing a book. And I thought, oh gosh, I'll never meet anybody at the school or get to know anything about it. And then this letter came around saying, do you want to stand as a parent governor? So I thought, oh, I'll do that. Then I'll have another way in. To... So I became a parent governor of this school, Gospel Oak Primary School. And it was a school that was really failing. It had a very, had a great deal of, had had a great deal of cachet around it in the local area. I think I write in the book about one, I can't remember if I name it, but one sort of local celebrity who sent his kids to that primary school and the school where my sons went to and he said it was considered sort of, it was like the eaten of the guards of north london so this school had been rep- dining out on its old reputation but that the old head had gone somebody else had come in it was really failing and it was one of the first schools to be uh, inspected by ofsted so and that it was an extraordinary experience i still got the report and i mean people would be shocked if they saw what ofsted reports were like then i mean they were amazing documents they were very long and detailed inspections they were very long and detailed reports mm. they were obviously very expensive and time consuming to do but they did tell you a lot about the school and one of the reasons why i was to defend the idea of inspection not necessarily offset in its current form is in that school it exposed things that needed to be exposed yeah it was, ter- it was terrible what was going on there there were children who were leaving the school without being to read be able to read and write it was a two form entry school so you could have children in one class who were doing quite well, not children in another class who were just not getting the same education. And then I remember one mother saying she went to her parents, even she was in tears, she, she asked to see her children's work, and there was no work. So it was bad. It was very, very bad. And Ofsted came in and they shone a spotlight on that. And as a result of that, the head teacher left. I was on the governing body by this time. It was all very painful. Most of the middle class parents left the school, including many of my friends. But a group of us stayed and decided we were going to try and kind of turn it around, whether on the governing body or the parents' association. But it was really, really hard. And I think I tell it say this in the book that, you know, when we went to work at number 10, Alistair ran into Chris Woodhead, who was then the chief inspector of schools at some 
the corridor number 10. He said, oh, you know what happened in the gospel? It was an absolute textbook case of what we wanted to happen. Yeah. Which is the market in action. You know, people take action, people go, the school changes. But it was really hard because once you're in that market situation and the performance tables had just, the first league tables had just appeared in 1996, I think. Once you're in that situation, nobody wanted to come to the school. So we had lots of places. We ended up taking the kids that nobody else wanted. And when the first league tables were published, we were the bottom school in Camden. And there was, like, I think, 38% of children reached the required level in maths and 40-something percent of children in English. It really was unacceptable. And it was a real struggle to, get, you know, to turn that school around, to find the right head. We went through two or three head teachers. I became chair of governors. So I was chair of governors for 10 years. And I'm pleased to say that the school is now outstanding. I'm, I'm no longer a governor there. But, you know, that was part... A part of that was the work that we did, parents who were going to stick by the school and 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 build confidence in it. And instead of seeing people walking the other way from it now, I see everybody walking towards it in the morning. Mm. And so that's, you know, it was really instructive to me about how the market works in practice. So when I made my film for Channel 4, I started it at Gospel Oak in the playground and told the story of what had happened. And then I went out to explore what was happening in other different types of schools and communities around the country. Um, and that became, at that point, I became really fascinated with education policy because I remember at one point phoning the then chair of Gums and saying, look, should I be worried about our kids and keeping them there? I didn't really intend to leave. He said, he was a very wise guy. He said, look, you know, you've got you've got a stable home. You've got a strong secondary learning gra- environment. You're both graduates, professional people. Your kids will be fine. And of course, that was right. But what wasn't fine was what was going on with the other kids when that school was failing, who didn't have the, the support at home, et cetera. And from then on, I've, that's become my sort of obsession is, you know, we've got to create schools that can do things for those kids. And so much of the education debate is about parent choice of the most affluent parents, you know, the most privileged parents, and can they get their kids into the school they want to. And, you know, it's not really about them. Their kids are going to be fine. I'm sure if you went to pretty good comprehensive school, your kids would be fine if you've got a supportive home environment and, you know, good teachers and so on. But you can't be sure that if you've got a, come from a chaotic, disadvantaged home that you will be fine unless the education system supports you to have all those things that you don't have that the other kids do have. And at the moment, we're failing on that front massively. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? So, so, so when Chris Woodhead said that thing, just for for the benefit of this, is Chris Woodhead was 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 quite a controversial figure, wasn't he? He was the first chief inspector. Was he the first one? He was certainly one of the. He was an, uh, yeah, an he early was chief one. inspector. He was the first one, and then the, I think it was very controversial because Labour re, um, renewed his term. Yeah, and he was not not well liked among the profession, and he was before he described himself as a trendy progressive teacher when he himself was a teacher, yeah. and then he became this sort of fierce. Um, advocate of of traditionalism. Yeah, I mean, people were saying ridiculous things like, you know, there's three hundred thousand failing teachers in this country. I mean, he yeah. liked to catch teachers all the time, and I, that was the beginning of another sort of rot that's set in ever since then. Was that public servants are all the enemy, and they're not really doing their job properly, and you need us politicians to come in and sort of save your institutions. When in fact the reverse is true, as we've now seen. If anybody's following the COVID inquiry, you see that the problem is probably with the politicians. Oh my goodness, Probably right. Them. Absolutely. And that playbook has been repeated by Gove, hasn't it? With the blob and by Michael Wilshaw and others. Um yeah, talking tough is sort of seen as the thing to do. Um and so so what do you what do you what's your take on that? If you if you had a right to reply, I'm sure you might might have done at some point with Chris Woodhead when he said this is a case study, this is the model example. We went in we named and shamed that school and now it's outstanding it was right in a way it needed a spotlight shining on it it was it was a scandalous what was going on there and it shouldn't yeah. be allowed to continue i think what didn't happen was that it was very hard to put the support in in place after that um and what's happened since then is that all these tools of the market the performance tables and the often they're now the they're now the horse that's driving the cart i mean they they run the whole system they were only supposed to be a sort of accountability mechanism for other you know the professionals getting on with their job now they've become the thing that controls everything so it's gone way way too far but i, I have to say when i <clears throat> of course he got very ill chris Woodhead. you probably know that he got motor neuron disease later oh, in his i life. didn't know that and he and i were asked to go make a film together in northern ireland about the the northern irish transfer test because one of my other great campaigns has been about ending the 11 plus which did yeah. exist in 25 percent of all english authorities and so we spent these three days together in Belfast going around looking at the, and he was very disabled by then. I mean, he was in a wheelchair and he was being sort of cared for by his, I think, the second wife, but, or third wife. 
but actually, and we had a, we did have a laugh together. He was quite funny, Chris. I mean, you could, it, it, he he was a controversialist, you know. But when you met him in private, he did it in a very humorous way. So right. we did talk about it all, and we agreed on some things, and we disagreed on the other things. I don't even know that he agreed with the eleven plus. I think he just took it as a posture to annoy other people. <laughs> but then he set up a, a, a chain of no frills private schools that didn't claim charitable status and so on and he was convinced that that was the way forward but oh i read something about that yeah so in the end you know we did we, we ended up kind of as friends and then he died very soon after that so right but i think to go back to my point i think what happened at gospel oak was a good thing the school needed to be exposed but publicly naming and shaming the school in that way without mm. support mechanisms in place afterwards is yeah very badly wrong for the school and we we managed to turn that school around but it oh that's right yeah like not, not every school that is named and shamed okay. has that you know um and, and it, but it is interesting to to reflect on that though isn't it because that's that, there's another example in the book i think it was when you were talking to kevin collins mm. who was talking about what happened in tower hamlets mm. um and he was saying that um let me just find the yeah here it is so um in tower hamlets the the full off the, the full local authority Ofsted report was read out in the full council meeting. This was something that Chris Woodhead had insisted upon, and and Colin said that this was a really important moment to begin the change that was needed, mm. because people could like you know he said that the parents in that in that community had huge trust in the system, um, and then they started looking at each other and saying, "Hang on a minute, you've been telling us that this is good. What the hell is going on?" And that transparency and ability to see how well pupils in that area were doing compared with other pupils was the sort of the catalyst that that led to a really remarkable transformation mm. in Tower Hamlets, where it's now one of the, the highest performing boroughs, um, mainly local authority schools as well, isn't it? And, yeah, but they had very strong leadership in the form of Christine Gilbert and then Kevin Collins. They're great people who are very committed to state education and equality, leading them through that. And I think that, you know, right. that's what the system lacks. Now, maybe some of those people are in academy chains now, they probably are, but... I think you do need, if you're going to create a local, you know, de devolve everything to a local system, you do have to have good local leaders of education. And that's something that's kind of gone. I mean, I think they led that whole process very effectively. And they were challenging, but also supportive to their schools. Yes. Yeah. And then there was the London Challenge, of course, which was also incredibly important because that was a whole different approach to school improvement. That was about support rather than, you know, victim um, vilification. It was about, you know, families of schools, showing people where they were going wrong, but also showing them the people they could work with to help them get better. And, and it was incredibly successful. And that strikes me as a much better way forward. Yeah, I love it. They referred to the, the, to the schools as keys to success, didn't they? It was like they were just using failure. positive yeah. language instead of like, you're inadequate. <laughs> That's going to help. We're just going to brand everybody inadequate. And we're going to make you publish the word inadequate on your website as a little badge of shame, like the Duns cap mm. or something. But that just doesn't That's... work. I mean, it simply doesn't work. Because we no. see it those schools, they just languish there forever. They can't get the right teachers. The, the, you know, there's aspirant families don't want to send their kids there. And it just becomes a, like a, a vicious cycle rather than a sort of virtual cycle, which is what happens to the schools that do well, that attract more and more of the most motivated families. Um, you know, and then they, guess what? They end up at the top of the league tables. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so let's talk about the hierarchy of schools. What, what Tim Brinkhouse refers to as the dizzyingly steep hierarchy of schools. Could you just sort of mm. talk, talk, talk your way through that for anybody who hasn't sort of come across that idea before? Well, I think, it, you know, you've got to go back 150 years, two, almost 200 years, no, so 175 years now to see the start of that, because the beginnings of the education system in this country was the, the public school system for a very small number of aristocratic pupils. And then through the second half of the 19th century, you get these other types of schools get invented for children with less money. And then then they come into the state sector, then the state sector starts opening its own schools. And, and, and all the way through that, you've also got churches that are setting up schools so that's all been in, and all of that has been embedded in the english education system so after 1945 there was an opportunity to sort of upend it all wasn't there and make a, a comprehensive system but what happened was that the labor government decided to keep the tripartite system with the grammar schools kept the faith schools kept the private schools and that's the hierarchy so you've got the private schools at the top 
which, you know, selected by money and ability. Then you've got the grammar schools, selected by ability and also money, because you have to pay the tutors to get into them. Then you've got the faith schools, who use all these other com- complicated ways of choosing which children they're going to take in. Then you've got the sort of local comprehensive schools, which are part, mostly dependent on sort of postcode lottery anyway. It depends if they're in an affluent ne- neighbourhood, they'll probably do quite well. And then you've got the schools at the bottom end of the pile that maybe nobody really wants to go to, but the poorest kids end up going to because they can't get into all these other schools higher up the hierarchy. And that yeah. is, a, it's a, if you were starting from scratch now, trying to invent a, an education system, you wouldn't say, let's create a hierarchy where the richest people can get their kids into the best schools. You would, even, I think, you know, the modern Conservative Party would recognise that it would have to be something that was more equally based. You would start off yeah. with a network of comprehensive schools and try and make distribu- distribution of pupils and resources between them most equal. And I think, to be fair to go, I don't think he was really in favour of grammar schools. And it was very significant in a way that most of the new co- <coughs> academies they all set up were, had to be comprehensive schools, although they did, did then let grammar schools come into the academy system, it's true. but So in a way, the academy model has proved to be a sort of right-winger's answer to why comprehensive schools can work. They are effectively, most of them, all ability schools. But I think the trouble is we still have the hierarchy. And I mean, the big problem, we, we need the private school system in this country is a massive issue. And I think Labour's right to try and tackle it. Because it's absurd to think that you can spend £50,000 on a child's education and then a child who gets £5,000 a year spent on them is going to do as well. Of course yeah. they do as well. And so they can never catch up. Of course. You wrote a really good article in 2016 about that. And I think it was called something like because it was the, the referendum year, obviously, and you said, like, this deeply divided country has its roots in a deeply divided mm-hmm. education system. And you can just see that playing out, can't you? The, the, a, a system that has such, as you say, just such galling inequality, like you say, 50,000 a year compared with 5,000. And, and you know, I, I work sometimes in the independent schools, um, and they're amazing. Like, it's it's an unbelievable thing to go to an independent school and just to see the the resources that they have swimming pools and sports equipment and 15 rugby pitches and just like absolutely absurd you know level like the eton they've got three theaters their debating chamber they do just i've been been to eton i've seen it all i've seen the 27 rugby football pitches i've seen yeah I mean, it just is an absolute shocker. And it's, it becomes even more shocking when you realise the people who went to that school, or Winchester, in the case of the current prime minister, are now running the country. So mm. what do they know about what it's like to be a kid on an estate going to a comprehensive school? And then people say, oh, well, you know, it's all very well. You sent your children to school in northwest London. Well, fine, but it is it happens to be the most one that they happen to have schools that do have the highest levels of deprivation in the country because all the middle class parents around here send their kids to private schools. And, and, you know, it's, yeah. yeah, of course, so our kids do make friends with other middle class kids, but they also grow, everybody walks through the same gate in the morning and they do know kids from, they've always had kids from very, very diverse backgrounds. Yeah. And I think the worst thing that happened in recent education policy was when, you know, Kevin Collins, who frankly should be education secretary in my view, came up with a proposal to recover from COVID. Yeah. And Rishi Sunak wouldn't fund it. And now they're dealing with the consequence. It's all very well them going on about attendance and this, that, and the other, and mental health. Well, you know, they could have done something about it back then, but they didn't want to, you know, squeeze the lemon anymore, did they? They just felt they spent enough on it. But it's about all of our children. It's not just about those children. It's about what sort of country we have. And yeah. and the, 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 the legacy of that period is really going to be damaging for, for I think, for generations now. Of the COVID period. The COVID period, yeah, and the go austerity, combination of austerity and COVID, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm inclined to agree. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering which way to take this next. I'm, I'm, there's lots of different directions that we could go in. Um, what, one thing that, that just occurred to me, again, we're fast forwarding a bit here. Towards the end of the book, you say that it's going to take tremendous courage political courage to to grasp this mm. this nettle and to try to figure out how to level the playing field of, of, of mm. through this deeply divided deeply hierarchical system and and i wonder whether like when when you say that it requires coverage so so one thing what, what you you mentioned that um that channel 4 documentary um that you made which the, of the same name as the book the best for my child 
Um, and you said that some of the some of the reviews that you received from that um, that you were a, a bigoted, disruptive relic of old Labour, the Daily Mail, um, obliquely deterministic big sister, and the Education Taliban. I can't even well, believe well, Chris it. Chris Woodhead said I was the Education Taliban. We did. There it you go, Chris Woodhead. But. You know, and, and David Aronovich, I think some, elsewhere said something that you were, you know, like an apologist for something or other. And I think, is that what you mean by political courage? Because the people who, like the, the establishment, the, 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 the media class in particular, often send their kids to schools that look like, that look like stately homes and castles, and they don't want somebody to come along and level that playing field. And so, so politically, or rather from a PR perspective, maybe, a government would just create this massive headache for itself where the 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 commentariat would come at them with everything that they had if they saw them coming after their precious private mm. castle schools. And they're doing it now over this VAT thing, aren't they? I mean I was somebody I don't read the Daily Telegraph, but somebody was telling me yesterday there was a there was a, a story in it this week about private school parents swarming the state sector to try and get you know, hog the places in the best state schools before Labour comes to power. Brackets, you know, they're taking places away from your children. I mean, people are horrid. They're absolutely terrified of any attack on on the private school system. Um, and likewise with Oxford and Cambridge. And I do think one of the quickest ways to deal with the private school system would be just to make sure that Oxford and Cambridge could only take 7% of children from private schools. Right. Because, you know, that's what they're paying for. If they thought that their kids had a better chance of getting to Oxford and Cambridge or the elite universities from a state school, they'd be very happy for them to go there. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think it's a... You know, these things are an enormous time and energy trap. And we're talking fundamentally about a Labour government, aren't we? And if a Labour government wants to try and tackle some of these things, it, you have to really pick your battles carefully, I think, because you can get sucked into having a, a massive war out over something that probably isn't core. To, I mean, I think the private school system is fundamentally part of the problem with our education system. But at the moment, the pr most pressing need in our education system is, is that group of disadvantaged kids how you get more resources to them, how you make sure you get the, enough teachers in the schools that really need them, where, which is still a huge problem. Um, and, and then I think, I, you know, my other big reform idea now is about the baccalaureate, is a sort of form of diploma baccalaureate at 18 rather than GCSEs and A-levels. So you can widen out the pathways, but unite them under one qualification when everybody leaves school to get rid of the academic and technical divide that so bedeviled our education system. So I don't think... I think, tag, I mean, I am. I continue to campaign on private schools and grammar schools, and I hope one day somebody does decide to phase out the 11 plus and, you know, phase out all the charitable benefits of the private schools. But I I, I think there are bigger fish to fry in, the, in terms of education reform at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Just briefly, while we're on that, the, the 11 plus thing, I wanted to pick you up on that earlier. You said earlier that the, the Labour government of whenever it was in the 70s, they had the opportunity to to get rid of the tripartite. It actually was a was a bipartite system, wasn't it? Because the third leg of that system, there was... There was I think it was initially tripartite. Um, and then yeah, it was initially. On the, very quickly. The, the, the technical colleges or vocational, whatever it was, didn't really happen. And so it was essentially, well, it was it was essentially grammars and... Yeah. Um, and secondary moderns, and they had the ability to get rid of it, and and they they sort of fudged it. It seems that they they sort of just said oh, they made it as a recommendation. It wasn't actually a it wasn't mandated. They just said it was up to local authorities to decide whether or not they were going to do away with grammars. And like you said, it's something like what is it? Twenty five percent of local authorities now still have grammar schools, and you're talking don't. about the Crossland tip period, though. The was, was it cross? Was, yeah, I'm going I mean, going back 44, to like the 44 Act in, in, embedded the tripartite system. Yeah, yeah, and then and then and then, and, then, and so so I'm talking about the the moment in which a Labour government in the in the 70s could have like the, when they when they got rid of that and they, and they got rid of the 11 plus, yeah. but they didn't they didn't mandate it. They just said it was a recommendation, and that's why we've still got grammar schools to this day. It's just one example of sort of as, as almost like the accidental. Is it just a real politic thing? I don't know if you're aware of this, but like, do 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 you know why it is that they that they sort of soft pedaled that and that they didn't just say let's just did. get that get rid of I, grammar I schools? They left it to local areas to reorganise. And I've just rewritten, I've written a short history of my own school calendar school for girls, and it was very interesting because I went back to the archive and read all the papers about the about, and it was all that that was all going on while I was there the row about comprehensive education. And there were vicious arguments about it, and many people who were very opposed to it losing its grammar school status. But 
I think what everybody recognised in the end was that it, this was the way the wind was blowing. You could not sustain this system anymore where you were, you were dividing children up and it, it was just not, it was contrary to the ethos of the time. So most local authority areas did go with that flow. So they didn't man, they didn't make it a sort of a requirement, but it did happen because there was a lot of political pressure and there was political pressure locally. I mean, people forget there was mostly Tory, it was Tory parents who, who went and campaigned a Tory education section because they hated the grammar school system so much because their kids weren't getting into the grammar schools, the Tory voters. What, the, what happened, though, is because the ones that dragged their heels, which were the 15 fully education fully selective authorities left and the you know the bits of the other authorities they sort of dragged their heels and dragged their heels by the time thatcher came into power she took the steam out of the whole thing so they were allowed to remain as selective areas and that's why we still got them because if we hang on long enough the government will change you know we won't have to do it and indeed that came to pass oh right but that need that should really be addressed because it is a terrible anomaly in our system it's outrageous. And I know that you and I were at the same um, event last year or maybe earlier this year, I can't remember, that end the 11 plus yeah. event. And some a few people spoke very powerfully um, about the impacts that it had had on their lives to be told that they have failed the 11 plus. There was that amazing, you know, the, the, I can't remember her name, the police officer. Oh, who, that who, was brilliant. Who's, uh, the, the, who, the, the Helen Mirren series. Yeah, Prime, <laughs> Prime Suspect was was based on her life. Yeah. Um, and she it was so moving and she she had failed the 11 plus as a child and that, that, that sense of being branded a failure really stays with you. And she became this unbelievably successful <laughs> uh, police officer, whatever it was, chief detective, sergeant, whatever it was that, you know, that, that series was made about. And it was only after she left the police and she did a master's, I think, mm. like, in her retirement it's years so and, and, and passed um, and said um, that, and, and when she passed that, she said, oh, that was the first time that, that she'd ever felt like she, she could you know, the, the the shackles of that 11 plus thing that she'd been carrying around with her for her entire life was finally sort of... Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a terrible, you know, it's a terrible thing to people. And I mean, there, we, I think we, when I was the chair of Comprehensive Future, we wrote a pamphlet about how you could phase out the 11 plus without abolishing any schools, which is what people automatically say you're going to do. So you would gradually, it wouldn't affect any of the kids who are currently, the pupils who are currently in the school, you would just do it over a 10-year period, which is what happened in the 70s, really. And what happened to my school is they just started taking, a, well, I'd left by then, but they started taking a fully comprehensive year seven. And gradually that worked its way through. Now, it was, it was bad then. It didn't really work very well then because there were so many teachers who just weren't skilled enough to teach a mixed ability intake, I think was one of the problems that happened. So you ask some grammar school teachers who've been used to teaching the sort of an academic top 30%, to teach a much wider, inclusive range of children. But you haven't got that now. I mean, you've got most of the teachers in this country are very skilled at dealing with, you know, the differentiated teaching and children from different backgrounds and children with different sort of aptitudes and potentials. So I, I think it could easily work. And, and then in 10 years' time, you'd have a fully comprehensive system in that area and it wouldn't affect anybody who was currently at the school. So I think yeah. it could be done if somebody was just willing to say, look, and the way to do it, in my view, is to have a kind of overall reform of admissions criteria which does need updating anyway yeah make yeah. that part of the mix totally i want to come back to to admissions um but but the, the there's something that that i mentioned earlier about the the sort of the almost accidental way that that things sometimes come about and there's a there's a really interesting example in the book and it seems to be linked to you know, in, in, in the book by Mick Waters and Tim Brighouse that we mentioned earlier, the mega tome, about a million pages oh, thick about, mm. about our schools. And the, there's a really interesting uh, chapter in there where they interview every yeah. sort of Secretary yeah. of State that they're going yeah. back. As, and all the office inspectors, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a very sort of sympathetic account of, yeah. of what it's like to be a Secretary of State. But it's also just sort of jaw-dropping. One thing being just, just how... Sort of unplanned it all is that somebody gets called into a reshuffle meeting they might have had an eye on one particular brief and then they suddenly get told that they're going to have education and i think estelle morris said it's you know it took sort of three months just to sort of put a team together and then you know the average incumbent of of any cabinet posts is was is something like 1.3 years and to be honest i think that that average has come down a bit i think we've had about six in the last year haven't we and so, so yeah. there's just this crazy sort of scrambling around for for trying to sort of to 
come up with policies that are going to to do something. It's all very short termist, and there's a there's a really nice example of this. So where where you were talking about when 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 they first brought in academies, this was under Blair. When they first brought in academies, they used to have a competition to see who would be the academy oh, yeah. sponsor between maintained, community, voluntary aided, and what have you. If the LA wanted to bid, then there would be an arm's length adjudicator. Otherwise, the the LA would yeah, adjudicate this is it. The Haringey story. I don't. It doesn't go into a particular into a particular thing, but it just sort of says that you wrote. Unfortunately, for the pro academy reformers in the Blair government, some of the earliest competitions were won by LA schools, local authority schools. I don't know if that was the thing yeah. that happened in, in Haringey, was it? Defeating the very object of the process to break up local authorities and running the risk that the much treasured diversity project would stall. So the DFES at the time it was called the Department of Education and Skills uh, introduced the preferred. Mm. sponsor route which effectively allowed ministers to leapfrog the competitions process and impose their own academy sponsors institutionalizing an opaque shadowy process that still exists today whereby new schools are commissioned behind closed doors in whitehall and existing schools are passed around between different providers without any real local consultation or oversight it's really interesting example of just sort of how mm. it's a bit blundery, isn't it? It's just like, oh, this isn't working. Let's just try this, and it's like a sticking plaster yeah, approach. You know, it's like it's it's weird, it's more and more centralized. You know, right? Absolutely, and more, yeah, and, and less and less accountable and transparent and and dodgy, and and that's one of the one of the problems. That I, I learned to move into sort of into the dark side bit because mm. I think that we I think that we've given a reasonable account of you know why there's a strong case for. For, for having some sort of parental choice, for some degree of competition, for some degree, certainly for a degree of accountability. But as with all things, like you can go too far in, in either direction. Um, and, and one thing that it's done, that, 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 that behind closed doors, that shift to, to sort of to move away from public scrutiny has meant that there's all of this quite unethical stuff happening. And Warwick Mansell has done an amazing job of, of, of cataloging lots of it um of financial irregularities of um of admissions irregularities of you know just people essentially doing the things that you said earlier people using the tools of the market or essentially using anything at their disposal to make the school look good and in a, in a culture of high accountability you can see why people would be incentivized to do that to continue to be able to to pay their mortgage so it seems like sort of with the best of intentions we kind of seem to have through a series of, like you say, it's often these quite powerful individual figures, Andrew Adonis being one in recent years, um, Gove being another, um, often quite sort of powerful single people who happen to be, you know, have their hands on the levers of power at that point in time, who sort of cobble this stuff together. And it was all a bit, you know, like with, with, the, with the Gove thing, um, there was an interesting interview in the book with Sam Friedman who said, it was basically like the Wild West. They hadn't anticipated the mm. extent to which schools would just flood in, and they were totally overwhelmed, and they, and over they didn't have the capacity within the Department for Education to to deal with all of these schools that were suddenly under their remit. Um, and so we say like we sort of accidentally created this mad situation, and each person is going to be gone in an, in another year and gone in another year. And, mm. and so I'd, I'd like to briefly explore the dark side and then wrap up, if we may, to sort of to think about that broader picture. And this isn't stuff that you really talk about in the book about the policy environment, which it seems is quite dysfunctional and very short termist, mm. and how we might start to figure figure a way through that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, the dark side thing, I mean, they were, my favourite one really, it was, although it's so appalling, it makes you want to tell you how it's the Durand Academy, which I think I write about in the book. Where this yeah, dark, can you talk about that bit? I can't remember, I can't remember, Greg, what's his name, Greg something or other. Martin, is it? Greg Martin, he became the head teacher of this primary school. He, it was very, very successful with a, with a very disadvantaged, largely black intake in somewhere in South London, Lambeth, I think. Um but he just spotted this avenue to kind of enrich himself. And somehow or other, he, he built a swimming pool on the site and then he, he started a sort of dating app or a dating site which he was running from the school. And, and somehow or other, he got the Department for Education to sign over the land of the school to him. And then he persuaded them that he needed to buy this site in West. In this, I've been there actually. It was a it was derelict when I got because the school never got, the thing got never got built. But to buy this site in West Sussex to build a, a boarding 
house for his school, which was a school dubbed by Go to be sort of the Eton of the state sector and everything. And it was a ludicrous idea. These children from Lambeth were going to be bussed to Sussex every Monday morning and brought back on Friday night. And anyway, it never worked. And it turned out there was massive sort of, you know, I will not take care of what I say, but there was some financial irregularities there behind the scene. But my point is at the end of it all, um, getting everything back into the public sphere was very very difficult because they just sort of they sort of traded all these public assets with people i think that's what's happened a lot in the right there's a rush to to academize with these kind of hero heads that they created that anything they do must be good until it turned out they all had feet of clay and nearly all of them have has turned out to have feet of clay or been up to something that's no good but that's only one side of it i mean the other dark side is the perverse incentives that exist in the system to off roll and to Fiddler admissions. There's the other dark side, which is how you can manipulate the curriculum to get better outcomes in the performance measures. Everywhere you look, there's a way of manipulating the system to advantage or disadvantage your school. Yeah. Um, and that's what's got to be dealt with, really, I think. Yeah, yeah, and totally. I since I wrote the book, there's been a whole, you know, the other major issue is really the impact of austerity and of COVID. And, you know, the schools just don't have enough money to do the work they're going to do now. Indeed, indeed, and 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 I mean, there's there's such a lot of that about, isn't there? That's all. I I I didn't have the time to. I didn't want to just copy out all of the stuff in that in that section on that Durand Academy that you wrote. So I just wrote the, the phrase "super corruption," page one hundred. It know. was it was unbelievable. It was like the, the, just the the uh, the leisure centre thing alone boosted his personal income by four hundred thousand pounds a year. Yeah. But but there's, there's... Was, it was all these related party contracts. So they was basically hiring other people in his family or his friends or whatever to run all right. this business. Then there was another school called Perry Beaches. You've probably forgotten that now. Perry Beaches was this held up as this sort of fantastic example of, you know, what a comprehensive what a state school could be until the head there was turned turned out to have done something else. And those all the free schools where people were kind of lining their pockets with the. There's just not yeah. much scrutiny, but that's partly because the. The department, and then I said to you, if only, I remember saying something, writing something on time, if only local authorities had been kept in charge of all these schools, this wouldn't happen. And people said, oh, no, it used to happen under the old local authority system. So I said, okay, give me an example. There was one example of the school in Brent. It was the only one ever, anybody could ever come up with where the head had kind of made off with some money or something. But the truth is when you've got yeah. local accountability and the money's coming through the local authority, it's much, much harder. The Department of Education cannot run thousands of schools. Yeah. It's absurd. And there is a, a rich and unfortunate tradition in this country. You know, anybody who reads Private Eye, like there's no shortage of cases of, you know, snouts in the trough. Uh, you know, however you, I, I would describe it as corruption. Mm. Other people just say that it's sort of just whatever, there's grey areas or whatever. But there are lots of people who who behave in really unethical ways and line their own pockets and those of their friends. And, and, and down at, you know, there's one page in Private Eye that's called Rotten Boroughs, and it's basically exactly the same stories, but it's just happening at a, at a much more local level, of mayors and councillors and things who are, you know, like the misappropriation of funds and what have you. And there's a really it's, interesting... There's always going to be those people, but then what happened with their... That's it. You need to make their lives more difficult, though, they don't you? They did it because they could. It was just made possible for them that's to do it. Well, there's yeah. a really interesting bit here. So, so you in, right after the Durand bit in the book, you said in his book, Education, 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 Lord Adonis mm. explained um, why he resisted calls to put tougher legal regulatory framework around his favoured academy schools. And then here's a quote from that book. He said, this is almost unbelievable, this line. He said, in my experience, charisma, persuasion and money not legislation and regulation are the great drivers of reform. Mm -hmm. And then there's a beautiful bit of, of understatement <laughs> from yourself. You said, uh, today as the middle tiers of local authority evaporate and so on, um, it's hard not to escape the conclusion that a bit of order and regulation and more transparency about the processes of commissioning and rebrokering and supervising schools is what is needed. Um, yeah, absolutely. So clearly it's sort of incredible that it was i mean that that what well, that's not unwitting is it he's sort of saying fine like if, if people are going to be incentivized by money then just let it slosh around and 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 that'll be a part of this whole 
Yeah, I wrote about it. He wrote it down in a book so everybody could read it as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. It wasn't even yeah, it's just a private diary entry. Um, so that's that was interesting. And then and then the final bit in that dark side chapter, you said you said perhaps the darkest side of the market has been its total failure to deliver what is the single most important factor, an adequate supply of good teachers. And that is huge. Like not only just in the actual the actual process of recruiting teachers, but making teaching seem like an, an an attractive profession that you want to be a part of. And I think that that's also, a, you know, a downside of these schools where there's huge amounts of, of centralized control, like we were talking about earlier, teachers and not even head teachers allowed to decide how to organize their tables. I was speaking to a teacher recently who said that he's got one of these instructional coaches, like coaching used to be a voluntary thing, and it used to be like a, a self-directed thing. So you get coached and you sort of, the, the coach would help you to, to work out your own answers to the problems that you face. And now we have this instructional coaching model, which is like, in some schools anyway, it's a lot less voluntary. <laughs> this guy said that this, this coach drops into their lesson about, into their room about 40 times a week. And they give them very, very micromanaged advice about what time to, to say a particular thing at and why they should move the clock to the front of the room and why they should point at the clock at a certain time in the lesson to remind the children. And it's all just like, nobody, nobody would want to be a, part, be a part of that. I don't know, maybe some people would, but I, I certainly wouldn't want to want to be that sort of micromanaged. Like the need for autonomy is just deep-rooted and hardwired in human beings. Like people don't like being told what to do even when it's a good idea you know we've known this there's been lots of research on this the importance of autonomy in the workplace that people rank it even more than how much they get paid um people just like to feel respected and listened to and like they they, they have some professional autonomy and that's one part of it but it's not the only part and so yeah the recruitment and retention situation is grim isn't it you know in in the book five years ago you said <laughs> They were like the best, the, the, the worst figures that we've seen. And they just keep getting worse and worse from year to year. Well, I just think it's a scandal. I mean, I think it's, look at the story today about mouth cancer and people not seeing dentists. I mean, a country that cannot provide enough doctors and nurses to look after its sick people, enough teachers to teach its children, enough dentists to look after their oral health. I mean, honestly, it is a failing state. I don't know why right. people don't recognise that. That should be, I mean, it's, education is a basic human right, isn't it? We all agree with that. And if you haven't got enough teachers, then you can't you can't access that basic human right if you haven't got teachers in your area. And I've heard some horrific stories about people people teaching maths who don't have a, a, a pass grade at GCSE maths in, in English secondary schools. It's an absolute shocker. And yeah. nobody's talking about it. Yeah. I, w I wonder whether, just as a final thing, th this wasn't in the dark side chapter, but... The mental health crisis that we're yeah. having recently, that we're experiencing, again, you know, when you wrote the book five years ago, you said one in 10 young people suffer from a probable mental mm -hmm. health disorder. It's now widely regarded to be one in six, mm -hmm. which is almost a doubling from an already very high point. And you just think, well, where will this end? Like in a few years from now, will it be most kids have a mental health disorder? Will it be like the, the exception to the rule to be mentally healthy? I and I also to the other problem we've got at the moment, which is it isn't just schools that haven't got enough resources. The whole support structure around schools is disintegrated. So the sort of the, the other professions that did support schools, you know, attend in attendance in terms of mental health, social work, et cetera, et cetera, housing, family support officers, all that's gone. And that's partly why all these things are getting more and more problematic because that you used to be able to signpost kids and families to other places, but you you just can't do that anymore. No. Just to pick up the job themselves. Yeah. And then I, I know that mental health is always multifactorial, right? And you don't want to oversimplify it. But I wonder whether it wouldn't be going too far to say, suggest that the mental health crisis could be seen as another consequence of these market reforms that we're treating people in, an, in quite an inhuman way, um, like widgets, like, you know, just sort of uh, like a means to an end, right? What can What can you do for the school, not what can the school do for you? And that doesn't that can't be good for morale, can it? Well, I think I think there are two things. The one is the issue of the teachers and why people either don't want to go into teaching or don't stay in teaching. And I think one of the reasons they don't stay is not a high esteem 
profession, is it? Because you have teacher bashing nonstop, don't we? Union bashing. It's not particularly well paid compared to other jobs in society and things like teaching assistants aren't particularly well paid. And secondly, the pressure is unbearable. And if you look at what happens in other countries, you know, comparative systems where more time is built into the day and the week for teaching professionals to reflect on their work, to plan their work, to to, to spend time together. I mean, I'm a governor of a school, and I we go. I do sometimes do focus groups with the teachers, and to do with professional development, or whatever they call it now, continuous learning. Um, you know, but they that's one thing they say. There's just no time in the day for them to work on themselves. So, you know, that it's just too pressured. We haven't, yeah. we haven't exhausted it to be a, a serious profession in which very high quality graduates come in and want to improve themselves and stay. And I think, you know, these statistics about people leaving after four or five years, I mean, that's even worse, I think, in a way, because you've yeah. invested a lot of money in training them and then and then they don't stay and they go off and do something else. Yeah, yeah. So... And there's, there's, that, the- and there's the mental health thing, I think, is, you know, we've just got to, we've got to make a big, you know, I think for, we've got to go back to that idea that every child matters and all services around children have to work together for the benefit of the child. Schools just cannot do it alone. And that's one of the awful things that Gove did, you know, he basically said all that touchy feely, stupid social emotional education, everything was rubbish. Oh, that's horrendous. It's all, about, that's the... it's all about, you know, facts and trigonometry and Chaucer and what have you. And he pushed everything else like that out of the offset framework so that schools have been left exposed trying to deliver educational outcomes without the sort of support they need to support people as individuals and child yeah. health. That was fascinating, wasn't it? And quite telling that bit where you said that <clears throat> Gove had referred to like social, emotional, and well-being, which is still like reported on in Ofsted reports as as a peripheral issue. And yeah. Nick, Nick Gibb described it as ghastly. Um, it's it's very interesting insight. And so and so so we, we there's no shortage of issues. I think we can we could say <laughs> that that with the I think that that and one thing that comes through from reading books like yours and the book by Mick and Tim and, and others and I have Melissa Ben and I know you're good friends with uh, on the podcast a while ago and and people who are a lot closer to the, to the action at the policy level often paint really quite a sympathetic account you know you've said lots of kind words about chris woodhead your former bete noir and and uh you know there there are there, there are people who like i think that people on on all sides of the debate really want the best for kids they they actually want to improve the system yeah. it's just that we're trying to do something very very difficult here like it's it's really hard and that's not to say that it's impossible other school other countries seem to have much more equitable hyper being and be hyper higher performing um, and not have the crazy hierarchies and admissions problems that we have here. Um, and so you, you say, yeah, to come back to that, that that thing that you said earlier, you say that it's going to take political courage. Mm. Is that partly because of what I said earlier? When you said that, is that because you think that there's going to be a, a significant backlash against it from people who, who are quite happy with the status quo and don't really want it to be? To uh, I, just, I think it depends what you're doing. I, I think there's... Two things. I mean, attacking the private schools and the grammar schools is how it would be seen if you tried to dismantle that. That will, yeah. that will lead to a backlash. I think the other side of things, which is reorganising and resourcing a different sort of system, that comes back to a totally different argument, political argument, about tax and spend. So at the moment, you've got the Labour Party, which is saying, you know, we're not going to spend any extra money, which is absurd, because of course they will. Everybody spends more money in government. So, because they're terrified of being told they're going to tax. They're just saying that because that's what Blair said, and it worked for him. Hey, so if they, think, if they just say we'll, well stay I mean, within I mean, the fiscal the rules. The problem is, it's a very different. Tony Blair inherited a, a, a economy that was improving. <laughs> it didn't feel like that to people, but Labour isn't. Go- Labour's going to inherit an absolute basket case, along with the effects of Brexit on top of it. Right. Um, so they're so terrified of being accused of being profligate and be saying they're going to wreck the economy, which, of course, is what the Conservatives are going to try and do, that they're not promising to spend any money. So it makes it very hard for them to actually promise to do anything because, you know, when I hear Labour people say it's not about money, resources, it's about reform. Well, fine, but all reforms cost money. They do cost money. If you're going to change a whole system, it costs money, all sorts of things. And there are things that need to have money spent on them in addition to that about reform. So I think that they're really tying their hands in a way. And I... Fear that I mean I think Labour will win the next election, but I fear that people will get disillusioned very quickly when they see that exactly the same problems are going to continue, and they're so much worse than they were in '97. They're so yeah. much worse, and that and that 
the, the money's just not there to deal with it. Yeah. Look at just I, the rack in schools. You know, there's going to be another rack along in a minute because school, not a lot of schools are crumbling, the ones that didn't get building schools in the future, and even some of them are crumbling. You know, what, what are you going to do? Say we're not going to spend the money on it or just going to let the schools crumble? These are difficult decisions. And you've got, you know, I think you should be saying education is a public good. We live in a world full of other people's children. We've got to invest in it to have a better society in the future. And we will save money long term by investing in it and treating it as a public good. Yeah. It's not a private good, which is how it's been presented for the past 30 years, to go back to the original point about the market. Do the best for your child and screw everybody else's. Right, that's it. And it's a very individualistic lens, isn't it? And and you make that point towards the end of the book that it should be the best for all children. And it seems to me that we need to have a child's eye view of this. You know, like we're not thinking about, you know, like one of the things that you talk about in the dark side is like these orphan schools, which is really interesting. Could you just briefly explain what an orphan school is in case people well, haven't come across that? It's an academy that nobody else wants. It's been taken out of the local authority control, given to one academy provider, sponsor, it hasn't worked and things have sort of fallen, got so bad to such an extent that its current sponsor doesn't want it or the Department for Education want to take it off the current sponsor, but they can't find anybody else to take it on. Well, they should be yeah. allowed to come to the local authority and eventually that's what's going to happen. And so you, like, one of the things that, that I think we need to do is to, is to have an approach to policymaking that, that has the imagination or that takes the time to think through how any particular reform might play out for all these different people at different levels. And if you're, if you're, how would you feel if you as a teacher or if you as a child found yourself in one of these orphan schools or in a school that, that has just slashed its art and tech and drama departments because they're just all about, you know, um, going, you know for, going for the results. They're probably, they'll probably be one of those left behind communities where people feel nobody cares about them anyway. So it just contributes to that sense of, you know, nobody cares about us. It's all great somewhere else, and which is partly true. It's partly true, but I think I think the bigger point here is that people say, "Oh, you need to take education policy out of politics," and I think there is a case of having some aspects of it overseen by a group of independent people, whether they're partly politicians, partly professionals, to look at things like the curriculum or qualifications over a ten to twenty year period. But you can never take education out of politics because education is very political. It goes to the heart of what sort of society. We are. So I think you need a mix of some standing back and allowing reforms to be implemented probably without somebody else coming in 18 months later and saying, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to rip that one up and do something different. But you also need to put it at the heart of a, of a, of a programme for government and for the country. It's, a, it's like a sort of martial plan, really, for yeah. re reviving a nation. And, and education has got to be a big part of that. And what, that's what I don't see at the moment from any of the politicians is any sort of big vision for the role of education in society and what and how they're fundamentally going to address what is a very tired old system after 35 years since 1988 with a lot of perverse incentives, a lot of dark sides, and try and make it a more productive system that works for all children rather than just for some. Yes. And and here we come back to the to the policy environment thing. Um, and I have an idea that I'd like to pitch to you, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I may. Yep. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So, so one of the things that I've been doing lots of work around recently is implementation and improvement science, mm -hmm. um, which are more sort of widely established in healthcare, really, not so much in education. And it's they're essentially like the study of how do you bring about lasting positive change in real world settings. And there's lots of ideas in this area, and I'm, I'm working on a book on this at the moment. Um, but one of them is, one of the, the biggest ideas is this idea of a vertical slice team or a cross-section representative team of people. And so in a school, instead of having all of the decisions around this, but let, let's say the school is reforming their behavior policy, say, usually that just falls to one senior leader mainly, the, the person who's in charge of behavior, especially if it's in a secondary school. And then they just come up with a policy and they, they you know, roll it out. And so we all know that the, the vast majority of school improvement initiatives that are rolled out in that way don't work. And instead of that, what we've been, I've been working with schools on this for the last five years or so, we have a vertical slice. So you take a cross section through the school. So you have that senior leader, but also a middle leader, early career teachers, the teaching assistants, the SENCO, sometimes kids, parents, whoever it is who's got some valid perspective on the thing that you're trying to solve. And um, and, you, and it's not just a consultation exercise. That, that group essentially becomes the, the, the executive tasked with overseeing that particular aspect yeah. of school improvement. And it works 
amazingly well. I've been doing this with hundreds of schools now, and the feedback is unbelievable. And because two things happen. Number one, you get much better decision making because you've looked at it from all of those different lenses when you're having having the, the sort of the robust conversations that go into making these decisions. But secondly, you get buy-in much more so than you do when things are done in a top-down way because people can see that they are represented on this team and that mm-hmm. they can um you know, that there's somebody with whom they can interact. And I, I totally agree with you. When people say, let's take the politics out of education, that's not something that, that you could or should do. But I think that you could bring more politics into education by having some sort of a, a cross-party body, a bit yeah. like a select committee, that's like sort of within parliament, but, but and, and where each, because people sort of, you know, the, the Fed at the moment is talking about, we need a long-term plan for education. I always think like we need plans, you know, like we need a plan for SEND. I know mm-hmm. there's been some activity on that recently. One for early years, for FE, for HE, for curriculum, for mental health and well-being, and and and. There's about 20 areas that I could list that that, that, that we need a plan for. And you could have this sort of cross cross party group that had, you know. And each person was responsible for for one of those things. So that there's one person who's like the SEND person, and they have a vertical slice team. So they have young people who have special educational needs and their parents and SENCOs and teaching assistants and classroom teachers and school leaders and education psychologists and so on. And that's their vertical slice team that helps them to formulate and implement and sort of tweak policy in an ongoing way. Likewise for the mental health stuff, likewise for the early years stuff. That would be my model. Um, yeah. and the trouble is how you implement these things, because you're basically saying that it's up to you if you do it, aren't you? I mean, schools could do it now, but what, what's the blockage to them taking those ideas up? They don't know about them or or they belong well, to... Well, I mean, way. they would still formulate policy and enact policy, but it's just that it would be outsourced instead of just having this. I mean, one, one of the main reasons that we that we have so many problems, I think, is that we just default to top-down change. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just it's the, the school systems are based on that. Totally the, you know, the, the whole society is premised on this idea that a very small number of often like-minded individuals who, you know, or cabinet ministers are all cabinet ministers, right? They're all, they're all, they're, it's very similar in that regard. Um, and you just, you, you know, groupthink, we've known about groupthink for decades, but we haven't learned the lessons of groupthink in that you need to have diverse representative groups of people at the decision-making table while not just farming this out to some independent, you know, quango or whatever. Obviously, you couldn't do that. It has to be a parliamentary process, but it seems that we could bring in that representation to a cross-party system, and I think that we'd get better, better policies. So, so the, we did, was your question how would, how why why would schools? Well, how do they know about it for a start? I mean, how do they know about it? How would they know about it? I mean, it would. I mean, they would still publish, you know, white papers and green papers and pass oh, legislation and what have you. So it's not just yeah, 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 exactly. So instead of having policy, so so that. So essentially, like, let's say Bridget Phillipson comes in and devolves edu- like decision making around education policy to this cross party group, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. that becomes the executive. Yeah, no, I agree. But, but there's total representation at the decision. And likewise, you could do the same thing in health, in yeah. transport, in you know environmental no, I stuff. I mean, I completely agree. With this. There's got to be some devolution down to another level. That's got to happen. I mean, Labour says it wants it to happen, but I think governments find it very hard to let go of power. Well, indeed, it's the ultimate Because every different thing, community has got different, you know, some needs are universal, but some needs are very, very different. I mean, you know, in London, you've got school choice is able to exercise because you've got hundreds of schools all on top of each other. If you live in a rural part of the country, you're going to be presented with very different problems. I mean, look at some of the rural, selective areas with grammar schools. You know, there, there is no sixth form provision for kids in some of those areas, and there's no transport to get to any sixth form provision. So you've got to have local solutions to problems. I completely agree with that. But let, again, that's going to take a lot of courage and investment to do it properly, because you can't you talk about the unintended consequences. You can't just sort of thrust powers back to people unless they've got the capacity to do the work that's needed to be done. And frankly, local authorities now don't have that capacity. It's just been taken out of them. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think good. we need good national sort of <clears throat> guidelines for what we want from our education system. We need proper devolution, and you need local accountability. 
the school. So all schools, yeah. not just one school, should be accountable to any local body, whether it's the mayor or the local authority or what have you, <clears throat> who are holding them to account. So it's not just the job of Ofsted, the Department for Education and the publication of league tables. Yeah. And it should be done in a more supportive rather than a sort of condemnatory way. So you are talking about success rather than failure and how, mm. how you support failing schools to get better. <clears throat> And so, so as a final question, then I know we've got we've, we've got to wrap up in a minute. Um, if you had, to, if you could give one piece of advice to Bridget Phillipson, if there's one thing, that, if, assuming uh, that she becomes the next education secretary, or maybe the next yeah. after one, however many more times it changes before the current administration finally uh, exits office, um, what would it be? Well, I think you've got to really prioritise. Have, have two or three really simple, big ambitions that you want to do. Um, focus on that and prove that you can achieve them. I mean, I take a parallel from a school, what happened at Gospel Oak School to go right back to that point. When we finally found the right head teacher, the school was a, had become a sort of basket case. We'd had three heads and it was all sorts of problems. But anyway, this guy came in and he basically said, I'm going to, he's called all the parents and he said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. This is what the school needs. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And in the first 18 months he was there, he just focused on those three things. You know, it was partly about behaviour, it's partly about English and maths and literacy and numeracy. And he made a difference to them. So you've mm. really got, at the moment, it feels like it's very sort of disparate what Labour's saying. There's a bit of oracy here, there's a bit of digital curriculum here, there's a bit of skills here, there's a bit of private school funding there. Yeah. That's a big, there's no narrative that they're telling the public about what education is going to be. So yeah. I would say, get get your narrative in order. Say to people, they may, this may involve tough decisions, but this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to leave public opinion. I'm not going to follow it. Because too often in politics now, people wait to see what the public think they want, and then they try and row in behind it. She needs to get more teachers into schools. She needs to make sure that the services around schools that, that support the most vulnerable pupils um, are invested in and can do the work that schools can't do. Um, and I think there needs to be some investment in things like enrichment and extracurricular, all that stuff that the poorer kids don't have access to at home. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Yeah. I, she may have other priorities, but I would say having three things and be very clear about it and, and lead the conversation about it and, and then do them in the first few years. And people will give you credit for that. Yes. And maybe there is a grand narrative uh, somewhere. People talk about Keir Starmer sort of like lost that the metaphor of like carrying this precious vase. They mm -hmm. said the same thing about Blair, didn't they? You know, like they, they're on the verge of taking power. You know, they just need to not say anything too bold and just get into power. And then maybe, maybe, the, maybe some grand vision will unveil itself. Well, but I don't it, think that, it's as very you say, bold to say we want enough teachers. I think it's just basically. <laughs> But, you know, they're going to say they're going to, they are saying they're going to recruit so many thousand teachers. But let's see. Yeah, if, that's how many true. Teachers do we need? Let's be ambitious about it. Right. Be, amb yeah. be ambitious about getting the best graduates to go into teaching and getting them to go to the areas that, you know, that need the teachers, the parts of the country that just cannot attract mm -hmm. teachers in the right subjects. Those coastal coastal towns and so on. You know, they're the ones that are really struggling. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well. On that note, I would uh, like to thank you very much thank you for. Very much. It's been very enjoyable. It's really fun. Yeah. Anyway, again. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. I've really enjoyed that book, as I say, and reading back through some of your recent articles. Um, I'll put some links to them in the show notes. If anyone hasn't read it, I recommend that they go out and get a copy. Even if it is five years old, it's still um, super, super interesting. Yeah. So thank you for that and for taking the time to, to share your thoughts with me. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing it. Meeting again soon. Thank you. We have an error curriculum which squeezes out the arts. So let's rethink education. There is a lack of imagination and not enough fun. So let's rethink education. Children should be self-directed, showing us their way. Let them lead. Transferable skills should be the core of what we teach.
Dream a place to play 